This is Decred in Depth. I'm your host, Angelo. And on today's show, we have Mr. Alan Feinberg from OKCoin. Okay Alex, how you doing? I'm doing great. How you doing? I'm doing excellent. So Alex, let's, uh, let's get into it. Uh, let's hear about your background and your genesis into the cryptocurrency space. Yeah, absolutely. So I guess, uh, you know, it's been a meandering road for me, similar to some other people. I guess it all started in uh, the fall of 2009, actually. I was uh, wrapping up my career as a minor league baseball player, uh, looking for the next step in my life, as it was fairly apparent that I was in all likelihood not going to progress to a, uh, a major league position. And uh, I was an economics major in undergrad, uh, though it wasn't my primary focus in school. My primary focus in school was that of a student athlete or athlete student. Um, But a lot of people encouraged me to get into finance simply because I was an athlete, I am competitive, uh, and I do have that economics background. And because I wasn't coming from directly from a university, I had to explore alternative options to get into the financial services industry. Uh, I didn't have the benefit of campus interviews or internships where I would be able to go work at a Morgan Stanley or Goldman Sachs very easily. And I wasn't really familiar with the culture in terms of, you know, the way that they prefer to, to communicate, uh, you know, the way that you're supposed to interview with them. Um, and so the most practical entry point for me into the financial services space was actually to work with a fan of my college baseball team who was running a global macro hedge fund out in Hong Kong. Um, this fan was quite wealthy, but he had some pretty interesting ideas that a lot of people, you know, almost 10 years ago were very hesitant to acknowledge. Um, he was having me watch videos about the foundation of the federal reserve, as well as other videos that at the time would be classified as conspiracy theories. Um, but because he liked the way I thought, and because I respected the way he thought, as well as his background on wall street, Um, you know, he asked me to work for him and I thought, you know, even though I had never been to Asia, he was the only person I knew in Asia. Uh, I ended up moving from the San Francisco Bay area to Hong Kong to work for this guy as an analyst at his hedge fund, um, in early 2010. And, you know, even though I didn't know very much at the time, I had the discipline to realize that, uh, I was a lot less successful than he was. And if I wanted to understand finance and if I wanted to understand markets, um, rather than question weird thoughts that it seemed he had, I should actually explore them. And so I actually read the Federal Reserve Act. It's only like, you know, 30 pages or something like that, written a little over 100 years ago. Um, And I read books like The Creature of Jekyll Jekyll Island and other other information that could plausibly be, uh, you know, defined as conspiratorial content. But it was, you know, in congressional records. It was, you know, acts of Congress. It wasn't um, solely YouTube videos. And with more and more research, you know, I came to realize that the Federal Reserve is, in fact, um, a private corporation that does, in fact, have shareholders that are, in fact, American banks. And I learned the nomination process for the Board of Governors, um, as well as the the voting process that determines interest rates or the price of money, um, was very controllable by uh, corporate banking and business interests in the United States. And, you know, at the time living in Hong Kong, I thought, wow, um, I completely believe what this fund manager is saying about the health of the financial services sector. And what that means is... Um, the Fed's probably going to destroy the dollar if you give them a long enough period of time. And so I thought the most practical uh, switch for me was to actually move to Silicon Valley, where the startups there would be most sensitive to uh, price of capital. I actually spent about six years working at Google. Um, And then, you know, I I did informational interviews at Coinbase, you know, back 2012, 2013. Um, But I didn't think a ton of the space because I I actually, at the time, uh, failed to fully embrace the network effects that existed within the developer community supporting cryptocurrencies. And so it wasn't until 2017 when the markets came roaring back um, that I took a second look at the space and I realized that a lot of the content that was being shared and circulated within the crypto space was the same content that I was reading in 2010, 2011. Um, And it was a really intuitive switch. And so I ended up uh, leaving Google, reconnecting with one of my best friends from Hong Kong, who connected me to OKCoin, who was interested in expanding in the United States and, you know, was interested in bringing on board somebody with my background. So, you know, it seemed like a good fit at the time. And uh, I joined last June. 
Excellent. And what was the the primary decision for leaving something something as stable as Google, such a large company, to come to OKCoin? You know, I think my understanding of risk uh, is very different than many people. You know, most people will look at, uh, you know, I own U.S. Treasuries. It's safe. I work at a large, stable company. It's safe. But if you actually, you know, do a little bit more homework, you'd realize that everything has a risk associated with it. And, you know, it doesn't matter if an employer has a, a stable revenue uh, stream or, or stable revenue producing product that, um, you know, will fund their ability to pay your salary. You know, companies of that size have, uh, you know, management consultants roaming around, figuring out ways to trim fat, make them more efficient, eliminate jobs, consolidate departments. And so just because the company itself will be, you know, in existence for, you know, the foreseeable future, it doesn't mean that the employees there will have jobs for the foreseeable future. And it doesn't mean that the jobs that they do have, if they do have them, will be good jobs. Uh, you know, one of the downsides of centralization and centralization at scale is the further you are away from the centralized management, the less rights you have effectively, the less bargaining power, the less negotiating power you have. And the org that I was in was a great org when I joined it, but it kept getting larger as they do within productive parts of productive companies. And what that ultimately meant, because I wasn't in senior management, was that a lot of the aspects of my daily life were going to become micromanaged by practice, even if it wasn't the intent of you know, my actual bosses to, to micromanage. If you're operating anything at scale with the centralized authority, what that means is inherently you need to smooth everything around the edges, you need to streamline everything, you know, all the reporting needs to be done in a certain fashion, all the assignment grading needs to be done in a certain fashion, and it ultimately, you know, over time sucks the, the life and joy out of, you know, what otherwise might be uh, an enjoyable experience with enjoyable people. Understood. Now, with your background in economics, um, what are some of the issues that you feel blockchain technology can solve? I mean, I think the first one is very sensibly the monetary issue. Um, I, you know, unlike other people who believe cryptocurrency can survive as a store of value, um, you know, I think in the future, there's a, a decent chance that it could survive as a, a monetary tool. And that doesn't mean all the time. It might mean some of the time. But I do think that the way central banks and governments are uh, predictably mismanaging their balance sheets um, will mean that people will lose trust in fiat currencies um, at some point in the future. Uh, I think it's it's hard for people to understand or, or grasp the fact that fiat currencies don't typically last for a long period of time. And the world has been on a fiat currency standard for you know almost the last 50 years, which is quite a long time. You know, typically you know, because people are people and people have predictable incentives and act predictable ways um, when when they're under fire, you'll see governments borrow too much, borrow more than they can pay back. Um, pressure their central banks, as you know, is the case of our presidents, uh, both now and in the past, to keep interest rates low and, and not defend the integrity of a fiat currency. And I think what blockchain technology allows through the creation of Bitcoin or Bitcoin alternatives is an alternative to a centrally controlled currency that has a history of mismanagement. Um, so I think first and foremost, you know, that type of technology excites me about blockchain. I think. You know, other other aspects, you know, could be interesting if there's actually applicable use cases and and certain things can get ironed out. You know, I think there's a lot of fraud in the supply chain for food. Um, I'm particularly concerned about that because I'm, I'm very cognizant of, of what I put in my body. And I know that a lot of the things I buy are not what they say they are. You know, I know a lot of olive oil is not olive oil. I know a lot of honey is not honey. And if blockchain technology um, can be employed by logistics companies to give me a higher degree of certainty that the olive oil I'm buying is actually olive oil or the honey that I'm buying is actually pure honey. Um, you know, that could certainly be an applicable use case as well. Understood. Now, how do you personally determine or evaluate the quality of a crypto asset project? 
Um, and, w- and which are some of your, I would say, which are some of your top projects that you personally view? Uh, you know, as far as, as far as I would go personally, you know, I think one thing that I missed out with Bitcoin in the beginning was the fact that there was a very strong developer community that supported it. And I think before these cryptocurrencies have um, daily use cases, you know, before they're actually used to buy things um, or before large swaths of the population accept them as stores of value, it's really important that they have the belief uh, similar to religions. And so I think Bitcoin Core certainly has strong Bitcoin maximalists that really, really believe in the, um, you know, in, in the value of Bitcoin. And because of that, and because of the history of Bitcoin as a secure um, st- and stable, and I'll say stable, you know, technically stable, not, not necessarily price stable asset, uh, you know, I feel confident owning Bitcoin. Um, you know, as far as, as some of the smaller projects go, you know, a lot of them seem really interesting to me, um, especially privacy oriented projects. Um, but that doesn't mean that I'm personally equipped to uh, say, you know, X is better than Y, you know, Monero is better than D, than Decred or, or Decred is, is better than Zcash or something like that. Um, and so the way I hedge my bets is I take a small portion of uh, my crypto portfolio, and I, I do invest in some altcoins. Um, you know, but I'm I you know as much as uh, I think that I have a grasp of some of the macro drivers to this. You know, there's there's a lot of things changing in this space that that it's frankly hard for me to keep up with. And so I know that um, you know some of the things I'm invested in won't do well, and I think some of the things I'm invested in will do well. And you know, frankly, I, I look for utility, um, technical ability of developers, and belief. That the community has in the projects. Now, circling back to OKCoin, uh, I guess what is OKCoin and what states does it operate in, and what are some of the plans that you guys have for expansion? Yeah, so OKCoin is a long-standing fiat to crypto exchange. We actually, uh, you know, launched several years ago in China, OKCoin.cn, and from 2014 to 2017, operated in China as a central order book exchange that offered uh, fiat deposits and withdrawals, as well as levered uh, levered Bitcoin futures. And then when the Chinese government uh, shut down central order book exchanges, we had to do some pivoting to figure out how we could keep our business alive and how we could regain some of the market share that we lost. And so we ended up opening up an office in San Francisco, California, um, last year, last June, uh, you know, we started having the space and I think we launched the exchange last July and in the process, we've been busy acquiring money transmission licenses, um, you know, state of California, Georgia, Alabama, um, Missouri, Maryland, Montana, the Dakotas, Arkansas, Iowa, Kentucky, uh, Pennsylvania, Utah, to name most of them, uh, maybe, maybe missing a small one. Um, but you know, these are, the areas that we're operating in the U S and we're also operating internationally. So, you know, folks in in Latin America, uh, folks in Europe, uh, folks outside of China and Asia are trading on our platform and we're doing our our very best to try to ensure that they're having a good experience and more people are going to come to the party. Excellent. Now, uh, what is the process for adding projects to, to the exchange? Yeah. You know, we want to make sure, you know, number one needs to be compliant. Right, we do not want to come close to listing assets that could get us on the wrong side of the uh, regulatory fence. So very much so, we do not have any interest in listing securities at the moment. Um, you know, very much so, we have no interest in listing scam projects uh, because that does very little for anybody in the space. Um, you know, users of a platform will not come to the platform very often if, you know, a majority of the options or even a plethora of the options that they have at their disposal um, are on their way to hitting zero. Um, And so what we want to make sure is that there's a strong community that supports a project that also has strong technology underpinning it that also operates in a compliant fashion. And so in a bonus on top of that is if we can be the first to market, if we can be the first to identify a project. And I think, um, you know, as it pertains to Decred, you know, if we could be and and the fact that we were the first dollar on ramp, um, you know, give us a huge opportunity for differentiation, both to uh, the Decred community and for folks who might, you know, at one point be interested in acquiring uh, Decred. So, you know, 
in addition to ensuring that the founding team is strong and that the, the project doesn't have, um, you know, a, a litany of, of issues in its history, um, you know, all of these things made Decred, uh, you know, quite attractive to us. Um, like the hybrid protocol had a, a pretty interesting governance model. So, you know, a lot of things that, that piqued our interest and ultimately led to a listing. Now, uh, you're seeing this uh, pop up in the space a lot. So Binance recently launched a DEX and many others are many others are in the work as well, along with Decred. Uh, do you see decentralized exchanges as a threat to your market share or as a complementary tool to what you guys are doing? At this point, I don't. And, you know, I think the reason why I don't right now is decentralized marketplaces don't have a ton of liquidity. And a lot of people who are acquiring crypto right now are doing it for speculative purposes. Now, if we flash forward 10 years and people are massively distrustful of governments, they're massively distrustful of sharing their information, you know, due to the last six data leaks, um, you know, from a similar to Equifax, um, you know, at that point, I could see there being more customer demand to float decentralized exchanges. Um, I think as it pertains right now to the crypto space, a majority of the people invested in cryptocurrency are not anarchists. This may not have been the case six years ago, maybe six years ago. Um, you know, the, the earliest adopters of crypto might have been extremely distrustful of centralized authority and centralized governments. But at this point in uh, Bitcoin and, and cryptocurrencies history, I think a lot of the people who are buying are you know, interested in asset speculation. They see, oh, price goes down, oh, maybe I can buy and it's going to go back up. For these people, they just want the best user experience and they just want the deepest liquidity. And so until a DEX can provide a superior user experience and superior liquidity um, and, you know, possibly help me get my tokens out if I forgot my password, um, I don't see the... Uh, I don't see the market share of decentralized exchanges remotely eclipsing the market share of centralized exchanges, f at least for the immediate future. Hmm, fair enough. Uh, so what are some of OKCoin's plans, I guess, to compete with the likes of some of the larger exchanges in the U.S.? You know, what do you guys do to gain an edge? I think we, you know, despite the fact that we're based in the United States, we're really a globally focused exchange. And so, you know, unlike... Uh, some of the larger U.S. exchanges. We do have um, a technology partner that sits in China. We do have uh, a very close set of eyes and pulse on the Asian market. Um, and we also have Chinese customer service, which a lot of uh, American exchanges don't have. And so I think it's important for us to understand where, where we're weak and where we're strong. You know, right now we did we did uh, close to fifty million dollars in in um, in daily volume yesterday, um, and it is on the rise. That being said, that's not a fraction of what Coinbase is doing. And so, you know, most people, uh, well, most people, if they don't know any better, will probably sign up for the largest exchange that most of their friends are using. And so, if that's the case for most Americans, that's fine. We're not we may not be um, the first exchange that they've heard of. But if we can offer something unique that uh, others don't, whether it's listing Decred first, whether it's giving underserved communities access to customer service in their preferred language, um, whether it is um, you know, showing that we want to embrace the development of blockchain through you know, various contributions to different projects, you know, these are opportunities for us to stand out and say, hey, you know, we're doing a good job too. We've actually been in this space for just as long as many of the other, uh, you know, larger fiat crypto exchanges. And this could be a better service for you. It might not be, but it might be. And it's worth looking into. Now, I remember when I first heard that Decred was going to be on OKCoin, I went to go sign up. And at the time I was living in Florida and I, I was not able to do it. I, I, th I think the only state available was California. Yeah. So, you know, as I listed earlier, we had about, we have about 20 MTLs right now. California was the first MTL, and unfortunately, we don't yet have a Florida MTL. And so I think, you know, as far as jurisdictions go, the U.S. is one of the most challenging juris jurisdictions relative to the other countries. Um, as far as the U.S. goes, I think, you know, it's, it's pretty reasonable to believe that the places we don't have MTLs are more challenging jurisdictions than the places that we do have MTLs. 
Um, New York is notorious for being very challenging with the requirement for bit licenses and uh, a very high bar that we are looking to comply with, um, but it's going to take some time. Um, and so, you know, I think we wanted to start with, um, you know, some of the places that would give us a shot, would understand that we have a very capable and very um, honest, competent management team. Um, so we could, you know, continue building our reputation as a trusted, regulated exchange um, to make it easier for us to get the MTLs from the, the larger, possibly more challenging states uh, when the time is appropriate. So, Alex, how does OKCoin work with its OKX counterpart? Yeah, that's a, a really um, common question, as you might imagine. You know, a lot of people get confused between OKCoin and OKX. A lot of people use them interchangeably, though that's not um, appropriate. Um, so, OKCoin and OKX are legally distinct entities with a common technology partner, OKLink. And so, the technology infrastructure that both of us license is coming from China. Um, the fact that we have a common tech stack enables us to, you know, chat with the OKX people on a, a very regular basis. Um, and the fact that we have, um, you know, a similar history to them and the fact that, you know, OKCoin used to list the futures product, um, you know, before we ended up relaunching and reincorporating the, you know, the same a similar futures product to what OKX has. And so because we have such a common history, um, and, and because we do um, have, you know, very close connectivity to them in terms of uh, communications on a daily or weekly basis, um, you know, it's easier for us to, say, partner with them than other exchanges. It's easier for us to share market insight with them than other exchanges. Um, you know, we, we even have a wallet to wallet linking function where, um, you know, users can deposit fiat to OKCoin. And if they're in a jurisdiction that OKX serves, um, they can instantly transfer those assets from OKCoin to OKX, um, you know, but we are legally dis uh, distinct uh, in our operations. And so the decisions that they make um, are independent, autonomous, similar to the ones that we make. Understood. Uh, can you elaborate a bit on OKCoin's Bitcoin dev funding project plan you guys recently just launched? Yeah, so you know, depending on when when this uh, gets cut and put out, um, it is one week from now, but it could be in the past by the time it's, this gets released to a listening audience. Um, we're doing let's build Bitcoin together, and the reason we're doing this is, you know, OKCoin's been in the space for a while. We've been very fortunate to um, you know, profit through free generation um, from the crypto space over you know the last five or so years. And we very much believe in blockchain technology, but we understand that our ability to succeed as an exchange and our ability to succeed in the space cannot eclipse the actual ability of the space to grow. And so what we want to do is give back to projects that we think will have the highest ability to continue to grow blockchain technology, spread blockchain technology, and increase the economic value produced by the space. Um, you could say it's altruistic. You can say it's intelligent from a business standpoint. Um, and this is something that Google did when I was with Google. You know, Google realized that if they want to make more money, they need to make the Internet more popular. OKCoin realizes if, if we want to do better in business, we need to make blockchain better. We need to make crypto more popular. And, you know, this is sort of the, the synergistic underpinning for, you know, why we felt comfortable to you know, making you know up to a thousand Bitcoin donation to the development community of our users' choice because our users are able to vote and and suggest to us um, where the where the donation should go. So, what are your views on community hard forks, say governance, and Decred has a, a treasury built into the protocol that uh, that kind of solves that problem that that Bitcoin has? So, I think it's interesting. I think you know. Conceptually, I'll support a hard fork. You know, I don't think that, you know, if if a, if two people want to split up, if they want to divorce, like I don't, I wouldn't necessarily support laws preventing them from doing that. Um, if I'm running a department within a company and I have a disagreement with the CEO and a bunch of people that work under me, believe me, instead of the CEO, like I don't think it should be bad for me to go run off and do my own thing. Um, you know, and that's the same way with the community. You know, if you're at a party and you think, hey, this party's not what it was when I came three hours ago and you want to take 10 people and go to start your own party, like good on you. That's fine. Um, I do think that the because the blockchain space has a lot of esoteric people, 
um, who are very, at this point, still um, driven by fundamentals and, and driven by ideals. You know, I do think that there could be a tendency to hard fork uh, earlier than what's optimal because people are so idealistic where people say, no, this is completely contrary to my ideals. I'm out. And I think what what the decentralized communities are going to have to acknowledge at some point, and that point might not be soon, but um, I think they're going to have to acknowledge that, uh, you know, some degree of consolidation is actually beneficial. Um, you know, there's a reason why communities exist in large centralized fashions. And, you know, realistically, it's because they could militarily dominate the, the, the more fragmented communities. And so, you know, just because you have a disagreement with others in your community, I don't think that, you know, the first, um, you know, the first answer is to split or even the second answer. But I don't think that, you know, people should be stopped from going off and branching off and, and hard forking, um, you know, should their heart really tell them that that's the case. And your thoughts on governance and uh, and decred self-sustaining model? Well, I think self-sustaining models are are you know obviously better than non-self-sustaining models. And I, I the way I look at uh, blockchain governance as a whole, governance as a whole, is sort of a, a concise and consolidated replay of governance systems that have been experimented by human societies over the last several thousand years, basically since the advent of, of an agrarian economy. Um, and so, you know, humans, we've cycled through various forms of uh, despotism, monarchy, empires, democracy, republic, uh, democratic republic, uh, oligarchies. Like there's a lot of different governance models. I think there's a reason why some governance models um, have turned out to be superior in a modern climate than others. And I think, you know, blockchain is going through that same thing where, you know, initially the biggest uh, the biggest selling factor was oh it's decentralized, and then I think you know with what I'm hearing with some of the projects, it's like oh man, we can't get anything done. Nobody's on the same page. It's like yeah, that's kind of how democracies work. That's how decentralization works, right? It's the opposite of high high degrees of coordination, um, but high degrees of coordination also have their downside. You know, it could stifle innovation. It could make it really constrictive, and so you know I think. You know, maybe when markets were riding high in 2017, a lot of the uh, blockchain people thought that they were, you know, very, very smart. And this decentralized thing was um, certainly going to be the wave of the future. And, you know, as the market corrected itself and, and then recorrected itself, I think, you know, what's, what's most probable to me is governance models in the future are going to have, you know, some degree of, um, you know, authoritarianism to them combined with the, uh, some degree of decentralization um, with them. Um, you know, I think it's great if you can mix a, a proof of work and proof of stake. Um, you know, though, you know, I wouldn't necessarily be the best one to, to comment on, you know, one inherently being superior to the other. But I do, I do like the, the concept of hybrids because, you know, in addition to myself being a, a hybrid um, you know, of, of ethnically diverse parents, I think that the, the more you can incorporate the strengths of various models, the more you can protect against the weaknesses that, uh, you know, going all in on one of them may present. Understood. Uh, what are some of the things that you're most optimistic about when it comes to the blockchain space? I just like competition. You know, I think it's great that, um, you know, people in Argentina have uh, an option to store their money. Uh, people in Venezuela have an option to store their money. I think, you know, one thing that that despotic rulers hate is competition, and blockchain will deliver competition to the monetary game um, that really hasn't existed in uh, a significant fashion, possibly outside of the existence of gold, but it really hasn't existed substantially in a modern economy where, uh, you know bankers and and governments have um, felt the right and have been able to tip the scales in their advantage simply because, you know, I think, um, you know, one of the Rothschilds was, was saying, you know, permit me to issue a nation's currency and I care not who makes its laws. And it's like, well, if nobody had that ability, if nobody had that permission individually, um, things could be a little bit more balanced. Alex, what are some of the threats you see in the space that could impact the growth and future of the technology? Uh, I mean, it's a very volatile space. You know, I think I'm long-term bullish on Bitcoin, but that doesn't mean the price can't collapse by 50%, just like it did last year. I mean, it collapsed by more than 50% last year. 
And so, you know, I do see that that being a, a possible threat. I think Google came out uh, last week or earlier this week with a, a quantum computing advancement that could render, um, you know, certain blockchains invalid. And so I think, you know, the, the world's always changing. It's always competing. There's always people trying to develop new solutions and better solutions to, to address old problems um, and, and new answers that circumvent existing security. And so I think, you know, technology is always going to be a threat to technology. There could be um, new technologies that invalidate the, the possibly technological superiority of blockchain. Um, governments can see it as a threat too. And, and, you know, it could be that, you know, if enough governments believed Bitcoin were, were such a huge threat um, that they wanted to ban it, like you can't make Bitcoin go away. Um, but, you know, if they decided to treat it as a controlled substance, similar to like, you know, if I'm caught holding one Bitcoin, I get the same punishment as if I'm caught with like a kilo of heroin or something like that. Like, you know, conceivably some of the more, despotic governments could try to do that. You know, I don't know how well they can enforce it, but they could certainly try. Um, and something like that would be challenging, uh, certainly for the, uh, for, for the ability for uh, a newly established currency to flourish. What are some of the things that we could expect up next from OKCoin? Uh, you know, we're continuing to build out our product. We brought some really, really great product people on recently who are looking to, you know, improve our API, um, make the, make the product easier for users to uh, to take advantage of you know we already have great offerings uh, great margin offerings for international users um you know we already have you know, pretty good liquidity in our books and so you know we're going to continue to bring on more people we're going to continue to make ourselves known we're going to continue to acquire more licenses to operate more spaces um, and we're going to continue to support the development of blockchain uh for the coming years and so, you know, I guess I would encourage everybody to keep in touch with our Twitter account uh, at OKCoin. Um, you know, we have a, a lot of friendly people. If you're in the San Francisco area, come by our office. I would be more than happy to chat. Um, you know, we want to be friends with everybody. And so I think, um, you know, we're, we're well capitalized. We have, uh, you know, bullish investors who are, who are going to, you know, allow us to continue to make progress. And, and that's something that we're all excited about. I'm sure. Excellent. Well, Alex, I appreciate you coming on the show. Do you have any uh, closing thoughts and a message for the Decred community? No, you know, thank, thanks so much for having us on to the Decred community. You know, sign up for OKCoin. You can buy and sell Decred on it, uh, as well as other tokens, should you be interested in theirs. Um, you know, if you do in the next several days, uh, meaning the last few days of September, you can participate in our Let's Build, Build uh, Bitcoin Together project that I mentioned earlier, where we are making a donation to the winning project, uh, winning Bitcoin project. Um, that'd be uh, that'd and, and so, um, you know, check us out, shoot us a note. We're easy to get in touch with, uh, we're friendly, want to be friends with everybody. Um, and, and so, yeah, bring your assets on, you know, trade them out for dollars, bring your dollars on, buy some more T-Cred, um, do your thing.